Hello, and welcome to the second program in our series, American Folk Heroes of the 20th Century. As we promised in our premiere episode, we will try to provide a pleasant look backward for our adult audience and a unique opportunity for younger viewers to meet a variety of interesting characters. Let's review a few points right now as we begin our second look into the past. First, we are interested in examining folk heroes who, by definition, are fictional or imaginary characters. Secondly, we are interested in the existing social environment at the time these characters first appeared. What year was it? What was our economy like? What were the most popular forms of entertainment? What other relevant information might explain why these characters could suddenly appear and become national celebrities? We know, too, that each folk hero came to us through a particular medium of communication. Last time, we touched upon a few of the more obvious medium. Storytelling, popular in the 18th and 19th centuries, books, radio, and motion pictures. Today's heroes are frequently the creation of television, but let us concentrate on those avenues more popular a few decades past. Finally, in each program, we will try to provide you with a sample of the hero at his best. We shall attempt to actually recreate the celebrity in a typical situation. In this way, we hope to better understand the hero and the reasons for his popularity. Today we shall study a folk hero who actually emerged in three different mediums. Created as a magazine hero in the late 20s, he enjoyed a brief period of popularity which encouraged producers to develop a radio series for him. For some reason, the frustrations of the Great Depression and the unsteady hints of another war provided only a scant audience. Even the genius of Orson Welles was limited in its impact on the listening audience. Wells, as a young actor, portrayed this folk hero briefly in the later 1930s, but he soon resigned the role following his meteoric rise in Mercury Theater on the air. Even the motion picture industry, enjoying its golden era, took a chance with this folk hero, but the basic plot of the films did nothing to make this character a national celebrity. The 1940s. The Depression was over. Franklin Roosevelt was in the White House. Germany was in Russia, and we were in the war. Just as suddenly, this once semi-popular character became an important part of our lives. Sundays in the 1940s met church in the morning, chicken for dinner, a fireside chat with FDR, and a visit with radio's greatest detective. young man about town. Years ago in the Orient, Cranston learned a strange and mysterious secret. The hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs.
The shadow was never really created. He liked Topsy, just grew. Believe it or not, in the 19th century, one writer speculated on the character of a shadow who could go anywhere, be aware of everything, and yet not be seen. The writer was none other than Charles Dickens, the creator of such notables as Oliver Twist and David Copperfield. In the early years of this century, a popular French villain was Fantomos, who also hid in the shadows virtually unseen and overheard the conversations of friend and foe alike. A little later, we read of the exploits of Jimmy Dale, alias the Grey Seal, who wore a mask and signet ring. He was loosely described as a man about town, and his girlfriend, who went by a variety of names, was occasionally called Margot. Originally introduced in detective magazines in the late 20s, the character of the Shadow soon advanced to the position of hero and became the central force in magazine fair and early radio broadcasts dating from 1931. But in the first decade, from 1931 to 1940, the Shadow achieved only a sparse popularity. His followers were sufficient to keep him from becoming lost to the ages, but he could hardly be classed as a national celebrity. Maybe it was the Depression. Remember, in the 1930s, we were suffering our greatest economic setback. Thousands were out of work. Many children learned the true meaning of hunger. But by 1940, the Depression was almost over. Things were looking up. Movies were better than ever, even if the economy was still a bit wobbly. Remember, too, that the news, the radio, and the movies had proven the existence of such things as spies. We now accepted the possibility of individuals moving in the darkness of the shadows. And two, shortly after the decade began, the war threat became a reality. We were in it, up to our leather necks. It was then the shadow achieved a national prominence that was keeping him on the air until late 1954 and in magazines until 1966. In the interim, a number of shadow motion pictures contributed to this folk hero's popularity. Who was the shadow? He was, in reality, a wealthy young man named Lamont Cranston, who was an amateur criminologist. He had traveled the world over a number of times, and on one of his tours of the Orient, he had learned a form of instant hypnosis, allowing him to make himself invisible. While invisible, he became the nemesis of crime, seeking out the guilty. Only his friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, knows that Lamont is also the shadow. Their adventures generally begin like this. Did you enjoy your dinner, Margot? Lamont, darling, the evening has been perfect. The charity concert was a delight, and the dinner has been a culinary masterpiece. You know, darling, you were the loveliest maiden at the concert. I saw all the admiring looks the men were giving you. Oh, Lamont, you flatter. But weren't you pleased, darling, at the crowd? I'm sure that this was the most successful fundraising event. Imagine all the proceeds that will go to charity. Yes. Carlton Crager, the program coordinator, will probably find that tonight's concerts are past his fondest hopes. Will the money be used to help homeless children, Lamont? Part of it. The rest will be used to help. Excuse me, Mr. Cranston. There's a telephone call for you. Thank you, waiter. Excuse me, Margo. Hello. Yes, this is Cranston. Why, what a coincidence. Margo and I were just... What? Well, how did that... Of course. We'll be right over. I'm afraid we'll have to skip dessert tonight, darling. Lamont, what's the matter? Who was on the telephone? Carlton Crager. There's been some trouble at the concert hall. He's asked me to come right over. Waiter. Mr. Cranston. Here, this should take care of our dinner. Keep the change. Please, sir. Are you sure you won't join me in the drink, Commissioner Weston? I, I need something to steady my nerves. No, thank you, Mr. Crager. Not while I'm officially on duty. Daddy, try to calm down. Remember what the doctor said. I'll, I'll be all right, Catherine. 
If you don't mind, Mr. Krager, I'd like to go over this once again. Really, Commissioner? Don't you think we've done all that we can? I mean, Miss Ashley and I were expected at a dinner party hours ago. I'm afraid you'll be even later, Mr. Lieb. There's been a murder committed and several thousand dollars stolen. I appreciate that, if but... If you'll sit down, we can continue. Now, Mr. Krager. That must be Mr. Cranston's father. I'll get the door. Good evening. Miss Cranston, thank heavens you were able to come. Rush right over, Catherine. You know Miss Lane, don't you? Of course. How good of you to come. Cranston, I'm so glad you came. Carlton, I thought the concert was a fantastic success. What on earth has happened? Commissioner Weston, are you here professionally? I'm afraid there's been some nasty business going on here. The proceeds from the charity concert have disappeared mysteriously. And a theater manager has been murdered. Murdered? Calm yourself, darling. When did all this occur? I don't know. This whole thing has been a nightmare. I... I... Father! Oh, uh, Captain. Father, please, Commissioner, couldn't this whole matter wait? There! You see? All well, this time, we're leaving. You'll not leave until I say so. Hello. I don't believe we've met. Mr. Cranston, Miss Lane, Mr. Andre Lee, the concert master, Emily Ashley, the soprano. A pleasure, Mr. Lee. Excuse me for inquiring, Mr. Cranston, but why are you here? Mr. Crager and I are old friends, Mr. Lieb, and I have something of interest in criminology as well. Miss Ashley, your performance tonight was magnificent. Thank you, Miss Lane. If you'll excuse me, I, too, am not feeling too well. Of course. General Squirt, Miss Ashley, back to our dressing room. Very well. But we may want the two of you later. If you're feeling up to it, Mr. Crager, like the a few questions. There's something strange about that pair, Margot. What makes you say that, Mama? I think they know considerably more than they're willing to admit. And Miss Ashley appears unduly concerned. I think she should be questioned more closely. We go after them now? No, Margot. You and I shall leave together. You take a look backstage. I think it's time the Shadow ask Miss Ashley a few questions. right back. Andre? Andre, where are you? Do you need a light, Miss Ashley? Who, who's there? Who's talking? Just a friend offering you a light. <laughs> My apologies, Miss Ashley. I thought you wanted to smoke your cigarette. Who, who are you? <laughs> this is the shadow. What do you want from me? Sit down, Miss Ashley. Relax. I only want you to answer a few questions. Sit down, Miss Ashley. I've heard of you, Shadow. What do you want with me? What have you and Mr. Lee to do with the theft of the charity money and the murder of the theater manager? I don't know what you're talking about. The truth, Miss Ashley. All right. All right. Andre promised that no one would be hurt. He said that everyone would think that Crouch and Crager had taken the money. He never said anything about murder. I wanted to tell the police everything, but Andre threatened me. Then Andre Lee murdered the theater manager. Yes, yes, the manager caught Andre stealing the money. Where is Lee now? Somewhere in the theater, where he hid the money. He said he'd come for me, and we'd fly to Mexico. There'll be no flying tonight, Miss Ashley. You remain here. Do not try to escape. <laughs> 
because the shadow will find you. Remember, Miss Ashley, you are to remain here. what he thinks would be back here. Hmm. I don't recall seeing these on stage tonight. Great Scott! This must be the stolen money. You're so right, Miss Lane. Andre Lieb, I thought you had met. I intend to leave shortly. I will be going with the money. And you. You'll never get away with this. That's where you're quite mistaken, Miss Lane. I have every intention of succeeding. You and Mr. Cranston have been doing too much snooping. Now, this revolver has a silencer on it, so I could easily finish you here. But I am a gentleman. Come quietly, Miss Lane. Put down your gun, Andre Lee. What? Who's that? This is the Shadow. You and Emily Ashley will pay for your crime. Now, put down that gun. Oh, no, Shadow. I know you're hiding somewhere in those curtains, but it will do you no good. No, Andre Lee. I am not hiding. I am standing right here beside you. Now drop that gun. Ah! Now your count will take this. Uh! And this. Ah! Lamont, darling. Margo, are you all right? Yes, thank heavens you arrived. Andre Mead murdered the theater manager. Yes, I know. Emmeline Ashley was in league with him. Emmeline Ashley, did she? Unfortunately for Emmeline, she sought her wealth through illegal means. Because of her desire for ill-gotten wealth, she became involved in a terrible murder. I hope the courts will go easy on her. But for Andre Lee, he will pay the full price all must pay to try to walk the corrupt road. to the forces of law and order. What did you think of this sample program? Could you answer these questions? Was the shadow an immediate success as Jack Armstrong? What elements of world history contributed to the shadow's growing popularity? Do you think this series appealed more to adults or to children? We hope that in our second program, you might have learned a little bit about our world, our country, and the kind of folk heroes who were a part of our heritage. We also have a set of follow-up questions which might provide an interesting quiz for you, just to see how much you were able to learn from this tele-lesson. This is Wendy Worthington asking you to join us for the next program in your series, American Folk Heroes of the 20th Century.